All right, good afternoon, everybody. It's five o'clock. Uh, welcome to our um, first really budget work session. So um, if you will, I will call the meeting to order. And if you will join me, please, in a moment of silence. Thank you. And if you'll now uh, join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Um, thank you. And if we can have uh, Madam Clerk, if you'll call roll, please. Yes, Madam Chair. Mr. Bryant. Present. Ms. Bryson Morsberger. Here. Uh, Ms. Dr. Kraft. Here. Ms. McKeever. Here. Mr. Morris. Here. And Morris Torres. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and may I have a motion, please, for approval of our proposed agenda? I so move. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. And now I will happily turn this over to Dr. Gurley. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna bring forth uh, Ms. Hoover. Uh, we will have Ms. Hoover, we will have Ms. Chuck and myself, we will, um, we will triple team this presentation today. We will um, attempt to tell a little story and kind of paint the picture of where we are heading for this school year, but also get your input to help develop um, this roadmap for where we go next. Good evening, school board members and Dr. Gurley. This is uh, the beginning of us kicking off uh, the FY24 budget process. This presentation will include us going over the fiscal year 2022 closeout, the results of the budget survey for 2024, the allocation of the FY23 budget expenditures, are reducing our dependency on the ESSER funding and focusing on our priorities for the 2024 budget. So we have closed out the FY22 fiscal year. Uh, the auditors are on site this week auditing our financial numbers. Um, we had a good year. Uh, in some ways and, and a lot of stress and strain uh, on staff uh, on, and others. Uh, we added $1,142,414 to the fund balance. Uh, the first 100,000 came back to the schools and then we had a gain share between the city and the schools of $1,042,414. Um, the reasons for the increase to the fund balance was we had significant vacancy savings last year. If you remember, um, Ms. Powell came to you last June to let you know that we had this vacancy savings and that we would be returning uh, funds to the fund balance. And then we also drew down our CARES 1 and CARES 2 funds as we had budgeted. This slide shows you the progress of spending for the CARES and an SR funding uh, through June 30th of 2022. We fully spent down our CARES 1 money. We spent down three, $3,805, uh, I'm sorry, $3,805,513 of our CARES 2 funding as we had planned uh, in our FY22 budget. And we will spend down the remainder of the CARES 2 uh, funds in FY23 
along with starting to draw down on our ESSER three funding. And this is the, and we have to use these funds um, before September of 2024, correct? Correct. The ESSER two funds have to be spent by 9-30-23. And then ESSER three funds or, or the ESSER funds have to be spent by 9-30-2024. This next slide shows you where we spent our CARES, expend, um, our CARES funds um, this year. Um, a good many of these funds uh, you will probably recognize and correlate them to our FY22 budget plan. To highlight some of the places where we spent um, money was on the social workers the school emotional counselors, the instructional assistants, book room materials, and COVID supplies. In the FY, well, in the General Assembly's 22-24 buying budget, there was a one-time $1,000 bonus for fiscal year 23. Um, Charlottesville City Schools is going to receive $414,603 to cover 385 uh, SOQ funded instructional support positions. And as you know, Charlottesville has more positions than the SOQ that the state has for us. So we have 408 uh, SOQ positions over the state. And so we'll need to add $439,405 um, to what the state has given us to provide this bonus to our staff. So at the November 3rd meeting, we'll be bringing a recommendation back to uh, pay for this out of our fund balance. And so I guess if you all have any questions about that, this is probably a great time to do that because this is we're using this as the first read of it. And then um, at the November meeting, we will ask for action. Um, so if you have any questions about that at this point, um, we can I ask for action. On the $439,000 to ensure that all employees get the um, bonus. And this was, a, um, like Ms. Um, Hoover said, this was General Assembly. Um, proposed by General Assembly as a requirement to all school divisions, the, the funds will be released. Um, the part, the SOQ part will be released on December the 1st. And so what we want to do is ensure that every employee gets that, um, that one time um, $1,000 bonus, not just the SOQ positions. And if you remember when we went through the budget presentations last school year, we do have way more positions than what's required by SOQ. So we wanna make sure that we value all employees. So are there any questions with regards to how we're making this happen? I, I just, feel like I need to see the rest of the presentation and like what other priorities we have as a community before I can have any questions about that. I think it sounds like a great idea. Obviously I wanna make sure like pay and money is like what our employees want and that's what I wanna be able to give them. But I also wanna make sure we don't have competing needs because that's a lot of money to just in the middle of the school year. Cause I know that we have, well. Absolutely. Okay. So we can make sure we come back to this one. At this point, I'm going to turn this over to Beth Chuck to discuss the 2024 budget results. Thank you uh, for having me here. I'm just going to skip through this fairly quickly, knowing that we have a, a busy agenda for tonight. But if there are any point you have questions, or if after reviewing these slides more carefully, even during the week or something, you want to follow up with me for additional questions, please do so. Um, we did, uh, after the discussion at the board meeting in October, I guess, we did reopen the survey to make sure that and push it out to students one more time and we got a good response. And so you'll see that staff and the students ended up making 20, 25, 28% of the respondents after it was pushed out. Um, and this is just a re reminder of the ways we pushed it out. 
Uh, question one, I was a very brief survey. Question one was think big and help us rank these big categories. Uh, the categories were classroom experience, which as you'll see from the results, these are really broad categories. So helping understand if somebody voted for classroom experience, helping understand what they really meant by classroom experience is one of the challenges of the survey. But that is where question two, in two is kind of a, um, um, a two-part question, but that's really where question two comes in. So in any case, the big buckets for, as I say, classroom experience, extra supports as needed, programs to develop students' talents, staff and student wellness and safety, and upgrades to facilities and operations. So those were the definitions that we gave to families. And then in a random order, they were presented with these ideas and asked to rank the ideas. And then uh, the question two, as I say, is really where you can tease it out what, what did people mean by classroom experience or by extra supports as needed or whatever, whatever that might be. So we'll get into that. And then the second part of that was what would you like to see reduced or eliminated? So as you can tell, the, the, big, uh, the big vote getter was classroom experience that got 51% of the votes. And uh, you, know, you can kind of slice and dice this in different ways to see who got the most first and second votes or things like that. However you do that, classroom experience really got the lion's share of people's um, chips or however you wanna, however you wanna rank it. Um, However, I, would, I do want to say that the people who took this survey, and you may have seen some of these comments on Twitter, you know, taking this survey was like asking me to pick my favorite child. Taking this survey was so crazy. How, how, how could I say any of these are not important? And also in their individual comments, people said things. You'll notice, for instance, that facilities and operations, generally speaking, got lower ranking than the others. But people specifically wrote in in their comments, Please do not interpret this survey as meaning anything that, that other than that you have my full support for the Buford reconfiguration. So I do think um, asking people to rank these was a difficult choice. And hopefully, you know, as we get into some of the feedback about the comments, when we ask people to think specific, hopefully that will give you some more uh, kind of meaningful experience. But in the end, you know, it really just reinforces what, what, how many of our families and how all of our students experience school is by and large in that classroom experience. And so I think that's really the big picture there. So again, just if you wanna see it by the numbers, that's the exact same, that's the same concept. So to get these results from the think specific results, what I did, and you're welcome, was I went through all of these comments and if they said, I want to support ESL, I in another column of the spreadsheet tagged ESL. And if they said, I want to support ESL and SPED, I tagged it for both ESL and SPED. So it could be one comment, but it might've been five tags or it could be one comment and it was one tag. So a, a tag, when you see a mention here, that's, that's me seeing I love my, um, they might not even use the word fine arts, right? I love orchestra, but I tagged it as fine arts to get it in the right, in the right category. So I was just looking for some categories that had, had enough kind of meat to them that would, be, that would be meaningful. And I only listed the ones here that had five plus mentions. Honestly, this list was really long and exhausted. There's a lot of things people want to, um, to protect about our schools. And I would say, again, we got a lot of those comments saying, I want to protect everything. And so that's, that's an encouraging word for us to hear. You'll see that fine arts on this slide really got head and shoulders the most vote, which you know we're known for fine arts. Our families love our fine arts, so that isn't a surprise. But one thing I do want you to look at uh, carefully in, in the next item, compensation. I think people love our teachers. And that was, that was just a, a comment, please. Even the students, please pay our teachers. They're really good, right? So, um, so I think you'll see that as a high strand. The, then the third line is where I really wanna call your attention for student supports. I created that bucket because a lot of people were saying, I want, ex I want, I want the kids who need extra help in reading. I want people to get extra help in math. I want kids who have, um, really suffered during the pandemic to get the extra support I need. So I created that category of student supports, academic or other there, but you'll notice just a few lines down that there is also special education. You'll notice that there are also categories for ESL. 
you'll notice that there are also categories for AVID in other ways that we give students individual supports. So I believe it's, it's obvious if you were to look down at the special education line or the ESL line or the AVID line, I think there's even another one that I identified in there that I can't think of off the top of my head. But if you were to add special education to the special supports line, I think that alone would get you to the same number of votes as fine arts. And particularly if you were to add ESL to that line, then you would be, it would really be the, the top vote getter is making sure that the students who need extra supports get those supports. And so, um, and a lot of these people were not writing on behalf of their kid. They were just saying, I know there's kids in my kid's classroom who need the extra reading support. And my one way or another, whether they're an ESL kid, a special education kid, a kid who's just challenged by, by their pain, you can tell their family has really been challenged during the pandemic, whatever it is, they were voting for that kid. And so um, I think that that's just a, that's a big learning that's not obvious from the way the survey is laid out, but there were enough votes for people who were particularly had a heart for our ESL students that I didn't want those votes to get lost in a bigger category called student supports. So that's the way I did it, but I want to call to your attention. And I, I did see one comment on, I think on Twitter that I think really kind of encapsulates the thinking of why student supports and the classroom experience got such high votes and it was somebody reminding the internet that when you give the extra supports to the students who need it whether they're english language learners or a special education student or a child who is struggling to behave in class whatever it is when you give the extra supports to those kids the classroom experience goes up for everybody so i don't see those as com competing priorities at all but those are, those are some veins that you'll find in this survey. And again, I'll, I'll leave the rest of this for you to, um, to see what our families thought are some of our greatest hits or things that they want to see fully supported. But I'll move on to the harder question was to think specifically before about you, cuts. Before you move on, if you just, um, if you just kind of take a mental picture of that, and we're gonna come back to this because we do think that um, this slide and the next slide um, are, prudent to like some of your a lot of your decision making to look at like how people responded and what their thinkings are um, as we think about like what's the big picture as we continue to develop this budget. Thank you. And so again back to uh, people like people like what they're getting that the top vote getter on what to cut was absolutely nothing right. 50 people, I tagged it in 50 different ways for people to say, and I didn't even tag the people who wrote, I don't know, because I figured that's honestly a different idea than saying don't cut anything. So those are specifically people who said in one way or another, do not cut anything. Um, and then other people followed up in the notes, like, let me know how I can grow the pot so you don't have to cut anything. So that, that was a vein. I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know how much advocacy is going to help grow the pot, but that, there was that sense reflected in the comments as well. Um, the next item was gifted. And I will say that gifted in this survey is a, is a kind of a misleading tag. I didn't wanna tag new gifted model versus old gifted model, but there are, there are a whole range of opinions about gifted ranging from, I don't see the value in public education having gifted programs to, I really wanna go back to that old model or I really love the new model. I think we need to fully support the new model, what, whatever it is. You'd have to read the comments to really tease out what people mean by that. But for one reason or another, it was listed as among the things that at least, hmm, let's look at that, 20, 27 people or something said that they were willing to consider pulling back on the support for that program. Uh, technology is on there. And I wanna tease out technology is more like our buddy Pat over here than it is like the ISTEM program. And I, I think the chief, um, the chief reason for that, I think there was some confusion about the ViewSonic boards at CHS that got a lot of mention, and not only at CHS, but I think uh, it, it was a matter, I think it was well communicated at the beginning of the project, but probably a lesson learned throughout that project was just to keep reminding people about, hey, they're going to see some new technology in your room, the old technology was expiring, we're moving to a more standard form of technology that you'll find in classrooms all across the country. You know, that kind of messaging, I, I think it was not always front of mind to people. So when I look for the top reason in the comments about technology, I think those boards alone got a fair number of mentions. So there's that. Um, and then the next thing is STEM. And I would say the one comment I wanna kind of call your attention to for STEM, and again, I'm, not, I'm just reporting, I'm not 
agreeing or disagreeing or whatever, but there was uh, some mention of people who felt like our, our push-in gifted model and our push-in iSTEM model uh, seek to provide many of similar enriching experiences. And so some people were wondering if there's a way to create some sort of synergy between those two programs or you know, use the staff, maybe find some economies in staffing to accomplish similar goals, but maybe with fewer staff members. So I'll leave the rest for you all to kind of uh, tease out. And again, I'm happy to answer any questions. I think that's the last slide I have. Uh, so I, I, there's a link in there to the full results. And at the very end, there's a few uh, takeaways from how, just for, mostly for Amanda and me, about how people do learn about the budget and what do they want to learn about the budget in the future. Hmm. Questions? Go ahead, Dr. Kraft. Yeah, um, I was wondering for, um, for, for particularly like the technology responses and even the gifted responses, and the STEM responses, did you break them out by, um, you know, whether it was staff, teachers versus parents versus students responding? Because I'm wondering I'm, how teachers mm -hmm. would respond to, to those priorities. I am going to confess, about halfway through the project, I really kicked myself because when I made myself a new spreadsheet to work in the tagging, I realized it would have been helpful to include that comment about who made the comments so that I could sort and filter in that way. Yeah. So we can definitely filter by comments. That's easy enough to do. And you can do that yourself and play with it. I can do it again to, to get you some more information. But if you're wanting to um, specifically see how many teachers voted for the tag fine arts, I did that in a separate spreadsheet that did not include the data about whether it came from a student or a community member or a teacher. Okay. Um, Beth, as always, that was, I'm sorry, Mr. Morris, where are you going? Oh, okay. I just want to say thank you. Um, that's a lot of material. And um, I think it's great high level information for what it's worth. And it was very okay. helpful for you to say like, oh, like 12 people mm -hmm. out of 286 responses said this. So it's really important to also keep it in context. But um, thank you all the public also for responding. And thank you again for um, pushing it out again to the students, uh, of course, their voice. Um, being really important as well. So thanks again for all of your hard work mm -hmm. and, and getting those spreadsheets out here. Sure thing, sure thing. Thank you for those kind comments. And also thanks to the board really for that reminder, you know, it looks like you didn't capture students, what can we do? It's just good, it's just a good reminder at all times to just keep pushing and keep looking for ways to get that student feedback. Mr. Bryant or Ms. Morseberger, do you have any questions at this point? Beth, I was just curious when you're looking at testing related expenses versus AP school paid fees, did they differentiate like what those testing fees might? Uh, some of it's open to interpretation because when people are writing a comment, they're not always super clear. But if, if they made any reference at all to advanced courses, AP, DE, I put them in that category. I got the impression for, for at least most of the others, if not all the others, that they were really just saying, how much money do you spend on these maps? Tests. How much money do you spend on these preparation for SOL type tests? Things like that. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, I would be curious somehow. I mean, I'll go back a little bit too and look, but to see um, teacher responses, mm -hmm. like what re was really prioritized by staff and teachers, please. Somehow, I mean, I just that... feel like that's kind of like we actually are engaging with teachers on a regular basis around the budget. So I'm not sure that that is. Uh, you know, I, I feel like the voice at the table is going to be much more important than what a survey results are. That's why I just don't want Beth to have to go back and re redo yeah. all of that uh, uh, for uh -huh. things that we're already doing. Okay, but I think if someone took time to to respond to this. Well, I guess I, I would also support that in particular. I'm curious about, you know, how our classroom teachers are viewing the new gifted model. Mm -hmm. Are they seeing uh, results from this? Mm -hmm. Or are they feeling like, well, I don't know, I'm not so sure about this. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that kind of information I think would be particularly helpful. And we, uh, I'm sorry, could I keep? No. I uh, would just say there might be a middle ground between me going back and retagging everything as Ms. McKeever said, but also me just doing a filter on staff and then if you're particularly interested in a couple of these topics like gifted or whatever, then we could just do a search for word, those words. That might be an easy way of a kind of compromise position. Right. Uh, 
um, well, two things now after, after you said that, I mean, it's really quick. We can really quickly do a, um, we can uh, do a, we can just filter out anybody. We can do a comments. filter, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we can quickly do that, um, and then all, the other part of it is to the gifted part. We are um, we are going to. I've asked. I'm working with um, Jeannie Fouts, and I know she had asked me to um, attend the next gifted meeting, and I, so we have a meeting schedule, a pre meeting, but I want to make sure that we are also communicating. Um, publicly how we are measuring the success of the um yeah how we're measuring the success and i think that that will um just help people to understand what's going on within charlottesville city schools so i think that that um but we, the word i was looking for was pivot table i'm sorry mm -hmm. we can quickly do a pivot table and we can look at by each person that took the um, survey we can drop that and that can be done within five minutes now mm -hmm. Not with the comment, but at least you can see how teachers ranked those big um, those mm -hmm. big ideas. So mm -hmm. that would give you some um, that would give you a little bit of uh, mm -hmm. a quick data point. So we can do that really, very mm -hmm. quickly. So. I, I'm willing to do a little bit more work. So I will. Yeah. I'll, I'll get you. I'll get you a couple of different ways of yeah. looking at it. The other thing I would like to do with this is just to make sure that my various colleagues who do gifted see whatever comments came in about gifted, the folks who do special education see the comments that came in about special education, so that the people who can actually act on some of these um, things, or it, a lot of times for Amanda and me, it's just a, oh, people don't understand that most of our schools already have free and reduced meals that are, and not, I mean, free school-wide meals. You know, that was, that was a pretty common thing. I would like for our schools to have free meals for students. When, you know, almost, or not almost all, but a, a big percentage of our students are already in that point. So sometimes, again, just for my colleagues, but also for Amanda and me to, under, to learn what do people understand, what do people want to know more about. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We're going to pick back up with Ms. Hoover. All right, as we start to focus on the FY24 budget development, we wanted to refocus you on the allocation of expenditures um, for the school division. 71% of our expenditures are allocated to personnel. And this percentage further breaks down into actual positions where 80% are our instructions. And if you want to know who those folks are or those positions, it's our teachers, our instructional assistants, our librarians, our counselors, nurses, principals, and assistant principals. Bring you back to we started using the ESSER funding in our FY 2022 budget of 4.5. We were able to reduce our dependency on the funding for the current year's budget to 2.1. And so during this FY24 budget process, we'll continue to cool this thermometer and reducing our dependency on the ESSER funding. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Curley. Yes. So if we can go back to that thermometer, I, I think that that was a really good illustration last school year. Um, and I think it was really big for me at the time because it was truly about our dependency on the one-time funds. And so last school year, uh, we did do things. Um, we did remove some things to kind of help get that down. Um, and so as we've done a lot of talking and you've, you've seen the presentations in terms of the, the graphs, um, so much of it is related to our students' experience. So if you can put it on that next, um, that next slide, Ms. Hoover. So, so much of what happens is based on the students' experience. And, and so when we talk about the students' um, classroom, it's, it's the classroom experience it's those supports that are needed. It's those supports that are needed for students. It's the programs. When we talk about fine arts, when we talk about avid, when we talk about gifted, 
Um, you know, when we talk about um, our student and staff wellness, we've talked, I mean, when you think about the um, social emotional workers that we put in place for our students, all of these, you know, our students come with a lot of um, a baggage, whether it be adverse childhood experiences. And so what we know is that um, you got to, sometimes we have to teach trauma before we can even teach the child. Uh, but all of these things come at a cost, right? And so we want to make sure that we are setting our teachers and our students and our principals, we're setting everyone up for success, our bus drivers, that they have the tools that they need to, um, and they feel equipped um, to address the needs of our students. Um, but it comes at a cost. Um, and, and so... I think for me, as I think about, you know, how do I set the stage for where we go next? You know, I think what we heard Ms. Chuck say is, you know, one of those comments that we saw on social media is like, this is like asking us to rank, you know, who's your favorite child? And we don't want to do that. Um, but we know that all of these things are tied to um, some type of monetary amount. And so, um, while we understand that it's hard to rank these items, we must, um, you know, as a board, you know, I know you are looking to me and to the staff to like, what's the direction? So um, we must. And I think the other part of it is that we must prioritize the needs of all students, um, which is sometimes a difficult conversation to have with people, um, particularly when we are having a conversation from through the lens of equity. And when we remove the lenses of equity and we have an, an equity mindset, then we know that we must develop a budget that meets the needs of every single child. Um, and I think that that's kind of like my last statement before I want to, before I engage more with you all, that we really have to remove the lenses, and we have to ask everyone to have an equity mindset. And so, in developing a budget that's centered on all students, what do we prioritize? Um, because there are some nice haves, and then there are some must haves, in order for us all to be successful. Um, and so what I want to bring you all back to is that initial slide when I, back when we talked about, you know, what does the experience of our students look like? And, and so, you know, for me, we want, and I know for you all, because you've said this um, on quite a few occasions, that we want all of our students reading on grade level, um, exceeding grade level expectations. I know that that is um, one of the priorities of the school board, but that also looks like people. And what we, what we know here, uh, what we know in this presentation is that most of our budget is connected to personnel. And that's a very difficult conversation and, and not one that I want to fully engage in today, uh, but I want us to be very, very thoughtful um, because you know, I, I've started to hear from um, people in the buildings that they're, they're worried about what positions are going to be reduced. And I often tell people, um, that I worked with Pat Cuomo years ago. And so I, I understand what it's like to be ripped. Um, I was ripped twice. Um, when I arrived here, Mr. Cuomo told me he was ripped the year after I was. So I, I know that this is about people's livelihoods. Um, so what I want to center the conversation on is not what we, not who we are reducing, but what the experience for our students will be and what will uh, what that will look like every day. Um, and then there's some very difficult conversations that lie ahead. Um, but for me, students will read on grade, read on grade level and exceed grade level expectations. Um, teachers will have the resources and tools that they need for students to be successful. Um, students will have the opportunities um, to 
engage in activities that they may not necessarily be afforded to the opportunities to um, given any other circumstance. And so I just welcome, um, I welcome your feedback in terms of what you've heard today so that we can begin to capture, uh, we can begin to capture those things. Uh, and I can do that in a thoughtful manner and, and present that to you when we all reconvene because the next time we reconvene for budgets will be in the month of December. Um, so I welcome um, just feedback so that we can start the, the team will be capturing um, your notes from this, from this meeting. Dr. Kraft, yes, ma'am. Okay, well, um, one thing uh, that would be useful to me, um, <clears throat> and preface this by saying, you know, I'm a huge advocate for um, any kind of mental health supports in our schools. Um, and I know that there's a, a significant need. I, I would really like to understand more at a granular level what, what's going on there, you know, like for all of the, the extra staff that we have um, provided to the schools, I'd like to kind of know what, what's going on, what they're doing, how many students they're seeing, what, you know, the impact is, do they, you know, do we feel like we're at the right level of support there? Um, are there any changes that we would want to make? Uh, so it would be helpful to find some way of just getting some more information about that to be able to really look at it thoughtfully. Yes, ma'am. If there's a way to do it. Yes, and we, um, I know we had that conversation last school year and I know that, um, Patrick Farrell and um, Jody Murphy began to um, to collect some of that data um, last school year. So we do have some information that we can present. We can make that information available to you when we have our December uh, work session, or we can make that available to you before. Um, so we can do that. So I have that written down here. And I say that, I mean, I know that, you know, even this year has been very stressful. Uh, and so I, I do understand the needs there and I just wanna make sure that we're matching the needs and the resources in the best way we can. So I guess this, this opportunity here, I mean, and again, um, we used to do this a little bit differently where we did two by twos and we came in with the superintendent and um, finance staff and had the opportunity to kind of share what our priorities are. So I, I think this is kind of what you're asking yes, for. And then also any comments or questions, you know, regarding the survey. So I don't know if everybody, you know, is prepared to necessarily do that. I heard from Dr. Kraft, she definitely prioritizes and wants to know more about mental health. And I know in the past, um, you know, we, added uh, some of the initial mental health supports with a grant a couple of years ago. And then we, you know, supplanted that with some of the ESSER funds so that we could continue to grow that. So I think, you know, when we're looking at that um, thermometer, some of that is that. And so we want to know, um, I think similarly to other people, you know, what, and this is hard. I mean, I'm sitting here looking at the thermometer and that 2.1 million, um, and I know this is preliminary, but I feel like I, I want to know how we're going <laughs> to, I want the next steps, you know, because this is really hard to look at that and have the survey results and, and to not know how we're going to balance the budget. Yes, ma'am. And I think one of the, some of the conversations we've been talking about, um, some of the conversations we've been having just in the like projections and, and scenarios is like, you know, I mean, there are a lot of wants. Um, there are a lot of wants. I think if you ask people like, what is it that you want? You can get a lot of wants. Um, but I think when you compare that with the thermometer, knowing that you have to also cool that um, in order to help get people what they want, they have to align with you know, our mission and our vision and what our priorities 
to ensure that students are successful and we continue to see, receive, achieve high student outcomes. Yeah, and then I think to, to align that with what you have said and, and what Ms. Chuck said as well, and I think I saw those comments on, on Twitter as well, and when we're really talking about equity and when you are advocating for your student or a student and wanting something for your student, does that ask benefit everybody? Or is that ask and want that you want for a student really only benefit you know, a certain percentage? And so that, that's where this is tough. And this is that tough conversation um, that I think we all, to some extent, dance around a little bit historically and have. Um, and we are known you know, for our, our arts and, and other wonderful programs here, but, but are, you know, do we equitably, are, are all of our students able to access those programs? Mm -hmm. And I'm not going anywhere with any of that other than having this conversation. And it's a hard thing, um, I think, for that we all as a community and as board members now are being asked to really consider. And, and it, um, it might be. Yes, ma'am. A little uncomfortable. Well, I think the statement <clears throat> that goes along with that, and it's not a popular statement, but you know, I'm never afraid to shy away from those types of conversations, is that uh, many times people want equity until it gets in the way of what benefits their child or their student. Um, and so I think we just have to make sure that we're using the wide lens and not the narrow lens. And I think we can we can have a system where everyone benefits and we can still maintain high quality programs. I do believe that. I do believe that. It's just, we have to prioritize like what comes first, second, third. Um, but I do think that we can maintain these high quality programs that attract people here, the things that we do really well, um, but we can also make sure that we have life ready graduates that when students graduate here that we can showcase that you know we are sending students out into the workforce and out into college programs and they're being very successful and we are meeting the needs of all of our students. I do believe we can do that. And I would just say that <clears throat> you know as, as part of that, I think we are in the in a context of our entire uh, the entire city of Charlottesville, our entire community. And I would say that this is a responsibility of our entire community uh, to support those, those goals. Um, and knowing that uh, some of our students um, need more in order to just to make sure that they are succeeding um, in school. And, and that's just the reality of our population here. So, uh, it's, it is really important that the entire community understand that and support that. And again, it doesn't have to mean that we're taking away from the experience of all students, but I think this reality is important if we're really looking through an equity lens, that's, that's part of the equity lens. Uh, and it's like we're talking in code. I have literally no idea what we're talking about. It's <laughs> so it's like, I get what you're saying about we're going to have to cut the budget. We've had to do that for 12 years. Like there was very, maybe one year while I was on this board that we had money that we knew we were going to have. There's just always these decisions every single year. So respectfully, I feel like we do that regularly as a board. Um, and, you know, I just feel like the way, you know, obviously I have priorities. I have children in school. Um, and I want to make sure that their friends, their peers, everybody has opportunities. Um, and but I, but I know it's on the ground is also really not always how we talk about it here. And so, I, I worry that if we take more adults out of the building or if we change programs, like how many students are we, um, you know, are we affecting with that? Because um, relationships are the key barometer for how well our students are doing. And, you know, we, we could talk about programs, but really those programs mean relationships and those relationships bring kids to graduation. Um, so I'm, I, I hear what you're saying until we have specifics. Um, I'm, I just feel like this is, 
I can talk all day about vague notions of equity and what that means reality, you know, but there's no reality. You're like, give me a proposal, give me some suggestions. Like, I'm not gonna say, hey, we need to de definitely invest in this X, Y, and Z, because that's, I think, not helpful. I wanna see your ideas. And I think, um, I really wanna make sure though, um, that we are supporting teachers on the ground in meaningful ways, because my child is going to school and reading every single day. There's no, I mean, <laughs> it's just not, I mean, reading because there's the work is done. Um, and that's my child. I told him, I was like, hey, I got, you've had your two siblings go through. So this is how you get through middle school. You bring a book because there's worksheets and worksheets and like the engagement needs to be improved. Um, and I know that everybody's working really hard, but if you take more adults out of that building, I'm really worried that even more children will be lost. So that's what I'm concerned about. And I think that's a really good point though. I mean, to your point about, I mean, middle school age children with your example, that sometimes it looks different that sometimes more resources stay at one school with the higher need. And sometimes you, you have to move resources from a school that's doing well, but in also ensuring that students have. So I think that that's a really good example. Um, and I know we talk about that this has happened historically, but I don't know that people have received that or they're comfortable with that model. Um, and so I think, and you know, I, I mean, the staff know that I say, I don't like false positives. So I don't like when they say, well, oh, yeah, I'm good with that. But then when I do it, they're really upset. So I'm fine with saying that I support that model that if there are more needs in a particular place, then more resources stay there. But I don't know if we've historically, as an institution, as a Charlottesville City School, subscribe to that because um, I think everything feels really personal. Um, it does. <laughs> feels really personal. So thank you for that comment. I was going to say, you were paying that. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, one of the things that's really been on my heart lately, locally, statewide, and definitely nationally is foundation up. We have to do, we have to put the money where it makes the most sense in terms of building a good foundation for our kids and for our staff members. And uh, Ms. McKeever, I think you brought up a good point in terms of engagement, like we can still focus on the foundation and still address engagement at the same time. Um, and that might look like um, we're talking about personnel and trying to cool our thermometer, um, but also putting resources to professional development that help that engagement while we're still cooling the thermometer. Yeah. So foundation up, that, that's the way I see it. Anything in terms of reading, mathematics, the things that we, the core programs, I think that's what we need to focus on in focusing on, um, I mean, Dr. Kraft said in terms of wellness, and I think we saw that in the, in the survey result and wellness and safety as well, like those key areas is where we need to focus. Um, I'm a huge advocate for STEM and STEAM and all of that, but if, if we need to find different ways to engage that, and that needs to be a part of the core curriculum as a physical manifestation, of those those key areas, and that's the way that we should approach it. Lashonda, uh, I just wanted to add that I um, agreed with you that that from an equity lens, we need to put the the money, the budget priorities into the places and people that need them most, um, and so just you know, when we're talking about the reading gap and we got the test scores a few meetings back, it, it's hard to imagine if if you're a student and you're reading below grade level and you're having these challenges, are you even getting the full benefit of all the other programs that we offer? You know, if I'm not reading well, if I'm not doing good in math, am, am I going to be able to participate in band? Am I going to be able to participate in STEAM and all these other programs? And so for me, that would be the top priority is the students when we were looking at those test scores and it was really heartbreaking that no matter you know 
when we're at schools that are performing well, it's still um, black and brown students that are not reading at grade level and are not getting what they need. So to me, it's nice to have all of the nice things that everyone wants and likes, but if students are graduating and they're going to our local community college and they're telling us our students aren't prepared, they need more, then it's a fundamental failure of the institution that we have all of these, like we have amazing programming, but there is a consistent group of students in our schools that are not getting what they need. So to me, that's the priority. Um, is addressing, making sure those students get the supports that they need, whether it's reading, whether we're talking about special education, or any of those interventions, because historically, those students have not been served well by how our budget goes together, um, and that needs to change. Mr. Brown. One of the priorities I certainly think we need to have is um, to continue to attract quality teachers to the school system, um, ensuring that we have competitive salaries that will attract quality teachers and support staff to the Charlottesville City Schools. That has always been one of my priorities. Um, when I met with Dr. Atkins, the first thing I said, we need to ensure that our teachers and support staffs are compensated. That's first and foremost. And secondly, as a fine arts teacher for many years in the system, um, at this point in time, it's, you know, that attracted a lot of students to the Charlottesville Public Schools. I am somewhat disenchanted that the core music program has just sort of dwindle down. I'm a little biased because I was a core director. I don't know if we have a large percentage of students participating in chorus, um, at least at the, ele um, the middle, up elementary, middle school level, uh, specifically. Uh, I am concerned um, that um, this opportunity gap based on the data uh, we received last month um, indicates that we have a lot of work to do with our brown and black students in terms of achievement opportunity gap. We need to put a lot of resources in, and we know we do know that the pandemic set us back a few steps, but we need to put a lot of resources in getting those kids um, back up to, to par. We will never get rid of the achievement gap, but certainly we are going to continue to work toward eliminating that opportunity gap. That is a concern um, with our ESL and special special needs students, um, we need to continue to um, fully fund those programs. Um, also, we need to look at when our students graduate. Um, this has always been a concern for me when I was um, here as a counselor. We sort of look at um, a, a one-shot deal, pushing everybody um, to go to college. Counselors know by the end of the ninth grade year, those students are on the college track. Um, we need to also talk about other options with our students, the military and, um, of course, community college, and not look at community college as a stepchild, because that's important. I see a lot of our students who come to PBCC, and I see them one semester, and the next semester, I don't see them anymore. Um, we need to also encourage, uh, make sure that our students, when they leave here, they have workforce readiness skills. So those who choose to go into the workforce um, will have those skills that will enable them to, to make that transition from high school. So there are a lot of needs, but I, I think those are the priorities. Um, if we are going to walk the walk and talk to talk about equity, uh, we need to, it's, it's, we need to go, we're gonna have to make some hard decisions. Thank you. I make one more um, comment about mental health um, in the context of some of what you all have been talking about. Um, I want to make sure that um, the kind of mental health supports that we have are working for um, our, particularly our black and brown students, that we have the right kind of um, 
mental health supports in our schools. And, uh, you know, it, which, <laughs> you know, it, it, not every, not every person, I mean, I'm a therapist and I, you know, work well with some people, but there are some people who probably wouldn't relate to me as well. So, you know, how do we, how do we view that? Um, anyway, if we could, um, you know, if there are ways of just kind of teasing that out a little bit more, that would be helpful. Everything. Yeah. Um, so that does conclude our. Um, I did take some notes. I saw Miss Hoover taking some notes. Um, Are you wanting to hear from me or? or... No, the, the floor is yours. Okay, floor is mine. Um, so I just want to thank you all for pulling that all together. I think the survey results. Um, I did get a little cheat peek at those um, with the PTO leadership, but I, I do feel like in the context of everything else that you've provided, um, I, I need a little bit more time to, to digest that. I mean, I think we've had a great conversation, a great starting point here. Um, you know, I think I'm not prepared to really um, say where I want the budget aimed at. I mean, I think, um, or the focus at this point. I mean, just if I were to step back, you know, I mean, literacy is always um, a, a torch I will carry. And, and as far as prioritizing that, and, and I think we've got a great start on that. We've already um, invested in, in training for the teachers. And, and again, there's a lot of good things on the horizon for that. So I think all of those things, um, I think the bigger picture, and I have questions that you know I can bring um, and send via email regarding some of the grants and the monies regarding ongoing air quality, um, indoor air quality and investment in that just for the health and the, and the wellness of our students and staff within the buildings. Um, again, I'm not saying this is prioritized over our teachers or, or anything like that, but just things that come to mind and wanting to really, and this is again, uh, maybe outside of this, but I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we have a lot of needs within the buildings as far as facility upkeep and things that are just really, really run down. And, and I know that's part of the CIP um, and, and working with city and all of that, but I, I don't want to lose sight of that. I mean, I'm hearing that. I want to acknowledge that. And I really would like some follow-up um, at some point from whoever has to do um, the tours of the buildings and, and where we are with lists of things that need to be done and addressed, you know, bathrooms that don't have doors, bathrooms that don't have soap dispensers, you know, all, all kinds of things like that. Um, another thing I'd really like to um, discuss a little bit further, and maybe it was said, um, is, you know, just CTE, um, CTE readiness as far as how Charlottesville City Schools can, um, you know, continue to support our students moving forward in, in that realm and what that might look like. Um, and, and again, um, students with disabilities and the ELLs, the students, you know, wanting to support them. So I think that's it um, for me. And if you'll just go ahead. Yes, I do want to come back to that. Go ahead. Absolutely. So th no, thank you for that reminder. So we um so we do in the month of so we are mandated to give the bonus for SLQ positions. If we decide to not do that, then there are um a significant number of people that um are not in SLQ funded positions that would not get the but the bonus. So the the ask is to ensure that every teacher gets a bonus, not just teachers who are SOQ funded positions. So we have, so you wanna talk more about how we're getting the funds? Right. I mean, right, the fund balance is the way we are gonna pay for it, the 439,000. Yeah, I, I just wanted to remind you that, that this is one-time use fund balance is for one-time use. And that this is a perfect use of fund balance because this is a one-time bonus. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I will 
tell you is this is very early in the year, so we don't know how the year will end. So our current budget could absorb it. I do have an email out to VDOE about using our CARES and ESSER 3 funding board, and I haven't heard a response on that. But in order to provide our teachers and staff the $1,000 bonus, I would like to have this in play uh, before December the 1st. I'm sorry, Ms. Hoover, can you, so I know you just said something about the ESSER funds and that, and I was looking at the, the remainder, the grant remaining amounts. And so I think you just mentioned something that I was trying to figure out, like, do we have funds that aren't allocated? I know you gave the, rem the remainders, the monies that are left. Are right. those, are those designated to, to other projects? Right now we have ESSER money. And I say S for three because it all came in kind of like one, two, three. Right now we have about $10 million. Well, we, we do. We have our, our full S for three grant still intact. We will dip into it probably, I would say probably 1.5 million because we have 2.1 budgeted um, in our FY23 budget. And you can see we have CARES 2 money still left. So we have CARES SR3 money available for us to put towards this if we get approval to use it. But the state is using their pandemic relief money, so I don't know why we can't, but I would like to have approval. I just feel like fund balance is like kind of secret and especially with respect to um, our cooling of our thermometer coming, you know, and all of this discussion of basically, um, man, what is that word that is just basic? You know, we just don't have any money. It's like, how can we keep saying we don't have any money? We have $13 million there and we have, we're going to give half a million dollars to this. And of course I want to give everybody, a, this is not about, like, I want to give everybody a thousand dollars. There's no doubt. And it's, Obviously the SOQs, I could go on a little rant about that and about how inadequate that is at the state level, just like their legislative, their JIS has indicated, JIS, whatever that is, the legislative services. So the issue is not whether or what, it's how. And I'm, you know, we're just in this budget season where all we're talking about is, we, we literally said rifts, like, I don't want to talk about rifts, like we, and so, uh, I just feel like, how do we cool the temper thermometer down? Is it half a million dollars a lot of money? So I'm, and I want that, I want that to go to um, the CIP, and I want our fund balance to go to the raise or the bonus. But um, I also, you know, I I'm being very, you know, I feel like we have this community is has uh, resources and it needs to support its staff support maintaining their buildings and we need to make and ask hard questions and I, I feel like what is that word where you're like we're talking about like we're basically have no money we have resources in this community and we need to keep asking our community to give us resources to support our students um we could always do it more efficiently and better um but anyway so that's a big tangent i'm sorry but um, if we can use the SR funding, that'd be much better to me than fund balance. And I did, um, I, I don't know if I said that to Ms. Hoover, but in my regional meeting this week, I know some school divisions are using uh, SR funds. Um, so that's an option that we can we can explore. Uh, again, it's, it's the whole non-reoccurring. So again, if someone from the community wants to be a reoccurring funding source, then we'll take it. But she said she's wait. You're waiting to hear whether or not we can use those funds, correct? And we'll correct. know. By I put an, an email out to our VDOE contact in regards to using um, these funds towards one-time votes, and I haven't heard back. So I can uh, ping her again. Um, Dr. Gurley, I wanted to make sure that you are getting what you need from us from the board and whether there, there are any other formats that might uh, provide you with um, more information from the board or anything else that you'd like. 
Well, I, from the board. So one thing that uh, hopefully people know by now is that we don't use one method to make decisions. So we are taking into consideration um, uh, the survey data. We've had meetings with PTOs. Um, you know, we're having conversations with teachers and principals. And, you know, for me, one thing I heard from Ms. McKeever is about like, what's the scenarios? Like, give me like, give me what the scenarios look like. The, the um, what was the word? Uh, um, the priority. So like, I want to prior make some, um, some priority um, scenarios and, and talk through with um, our stakeholders, our, our teachers um, about what these things mean. Um, and so we won't just sit in isolation and make some decisions that will have some significant impacts to our students. Um, again, I, I want to make sure that teachers hear me say how much I love them and that we are going to protect the classroom experience and the resources that they need to do their jobs each and every day. Um, and I know that, that, that the principals, we had a principals uh, workshop, I think that was last week, and they are also advocating for the same things. Um, and so it's a heavy lift. Um, it's not one of those heavy lifts that we like to make, um, but we are going to ensure that everyone has what they need to be successful and to do their jobs each and every day. Yeah, so this is um, a, a little unique in the sense, but I would like to... Now, do you have that? So we are, um, I'm going to ask a board member to um, read or provide a motion to go into kind of an emergent closed session. And I would like to um, just provide the public the reason why. Um, since this is kind of atypical, but we have just um, received notice when the, within the last 20 minutes um, that Albemarle County School Board is issuing a press release this evening stating their, their intention to buy KTEC. So we are going to um, go into closed session to discuss this. I move that the board go into closed session for purposes of discussing contracts, property, real property, estate, real estate um, under 2.71, blah, 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 E, um, <laughs> the Virginia code of Virginia. And uh, yeah, that's all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're pulling that up right now. If I can get a second, please. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you. And we will... I believe make this rather quick yeah. and we'll be we'll be back.
All right. Thank you for that short recess. And we are, I will call us back into order. And um, if does any, do any of the board members have anything else they would like to offer or add right now regarding this presentation or? Oh, something not on the topic of the budget, but I just wanted to make sure everybody knew about this, that next week, um, Youth Next is showing a documentary about a middle school in New York City, kind of a model middle school that, you know, has been very successful. And um, I think it's open, you have to register for it, but it's it's open to the community. And um, I'm I'm planning to go, and I you know I think it would be um, really informative for us right now just to kind of get a sense of uh, a school like that. So it's Wednesday uh, at 12:30, I think, or 12:45 um, at Alumni Hall over on Emmett Street. And if uh, if anybody needs the link to sign up, I can send it to you. And I think you can get a free lunch if you register. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, I will just double check and see if there are any um, community members who would like to make comments, if we have anybody online or in the Zoom room. I would just ask anybody who is on the attendee gallery if they would like to make a comment virtually to please raise their hand using the hand raise tool or to put a comment into the chat so we can acknowledge you. Okay, so we'll close um, comments from members of the community. I, I just wanna remind everybody or anybody who's tuned in that there are lots of opportunities. This is our first work session. So, um, you know, continued, um, like I said, opportunities to engage and provide us with feedback, ask questions, and, and we appreciate all of that. Um, upcoming meetings, we do have um, October 29th, we have a school board retreat which will be right here that starts at 8.30. And then we have our next um, regularly scheduled, ske regularly scheduled um, board meter meeting, oh my goodness, on November 3rd here at five o'clock. Um, Dr. Gurley, do you have any other announcements or? Tomorrow's Friday, have a good one. <laughs> Friday, all right. Um, just real quickly, I think next Wednesday, Dr. Bracey, um, is is having, and I don't have the the little flyer, but she is kind of put together a very last minute kind of fall festival focused with um, community partners for special education. And it'll be, I believe, downstairs in the annex and outdoors, 5 to 7 p.m. So spread the word, come, come check it out. Um, I believe there's going to be um, some treats and food, I believe. Um, but I, I think it's great that we're going to you know, that she was able to put this together really quickly for for the, the SEAC committee. Mr. Morris, anything else? Nope. All right. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate all the work, and um, I will adjourn the meeting.